Hi. Well, firstly, I just really want to thank Elizabeth Bird and Elizabeth Kiesack and also wonderful people that I've met here, like Amy Rust and Mark McCarthy, and all of the faculty and staff that uh, have made this possible to bring me here today. And <laughs> as Elizabeth Bird, as Professor Bird said, it was, since I started this dissertation process about 10 years ago, it really has been my dream either to be the queen of all zombie experts or sometimes in my nerdiest moments, I daydream that someday people will call me Professor Z. Um, <laughs> but in other ways, I feel like I don't even know the person that Elizabeth just described. I'm not really sure how this career just happened. I've just been on this journey and it, it's carried me here today. But I can't even play it cool. I just have to tell you how completely honored and thrilled I was to get the invitation to come talk to you, to see your beautiful campus, to meet some of your faculty and staff. I am thrilled to be here. So I thought that it would be fun and sort of set the mood of this presentation, which is going to be both playful and informative, silly and yet in some ways deadly serious. If we begin with a clip that I very much doubt anyone here has seen before, uh, because this is not from any zombie film. Uh, it's some footage from a live performance art piece, performance art piece that was staged by Gillian McDonald, in which the artist orchestrated an all night long zombie video shoot. And this took place in Toronto 2008, and I'm going to talk about it in some detail in my talk. Um, I added to it this background music, so this is not Gillian's, but let's just watch this. It's about five minutes long.
only did I help co-edit, did I co-edit this recent collection on, uh, uh, that's an interdisciplinary connect collection on zombies, but I also just finished a dissertation on the subject called The Modern Zombie, Living Death in the Technological Age, which I'm, as she said, in the process of turning into a book. And so one of the areas that I've really put quite a bit of time and effort into over the years in my zombie research is really in trying to trace the zombie's genetic heritage, if you will. So it was in part my intention today to share with you some of the discoveries I've made about the history of the zombie. But I want to make one small change. So as you can see here, the talk, of, uh, the talk that I'm giving today was going to be subtitled Revolutionizing Resurrection in the Empirical Age. But in light of some recent events, I had a change of heart about the direction in which I wanted this talk to go. And so I'm calling it instead Resurrecting Revolution at the End of Empire. And so what happened was this. These are some Occupy Wall Street protesters earlier this month uh, dressed as zombies. And so I thought that sort of our working question for today could simply be, what's going on here? What's going on here? What's going on with the performance art of, of zombies? What's going on with these zombie mobs that are occurring all over America? Uh, so this talk is going to present some of my dissertation research, some of the work that I've done in zombies, in, specifically in the area of art and social protest. Uh, but then I'm also going to share with you some research that I've done since the book came out and since the, the dissertation was filed, because zombies are constantly cropping up, as this is a perfect example. So I'm really grateful to have this forum to share my, most late, my latest uh, interest and research in the zombie. So most zombie film fans know that the history of the zombie is one that goes from this to this. It goes from the Haitian myth of a body raised from the dead and forced to labor for an ungan, or witch doctor, to modern day representations in film. And as we sketch in the book, there's an evolution in zombie cinema that goes from here to here to here to here. But it also evolves in comics and in video games, in books, in art. And we're going to talk about one, this installation in a little bit. And in real life. So what do all of these very, very different zombies have in common? Well, the zombie is always a slave, first to the witch doctor or master, who's responsible for his reanimation. And then, beginning with Romero, I would argue he's always a slave to biology, whether it's his own biological drive to consume or whether it's uh, to the virus that is causing him to become a zombie. If I have a thesis about the zombie, it is this. The zombie is always about slavery, but the zombie is also always about slave rebellion. The paradoxicality of this statement is perfectly in line with the zombie's duality. It is, after all, both living and dead. But behind this seeming contradiction, is the zombie myth's history that explains this paradox. I hope to hit for you just the highlights today of, zomb of the zombie's history, but it is critical to understand that the zombie comes to us from Haiti, the site of the world's only successful slave rebellion, slave revolution, and what was formerly the richest slave colony in the Caribbean. OK, everybody, so get ready. This is where you earn your seats to the double feature, because I'm going to go th through some zombie history. I know everyone thinks that zombies are a really sexy topic. I think I managed to make it boring in the next five <laughs> minutes. So if you were to look up zombie in the dictionary, you would find that this is a word of African origin. But it's not that simple. Are there zombies in Africa? When did the concept of the zombie as a living dead solidify, and how did it get here? Because I'm a student of language and literature, I was interested in charting the appearances of the word zombie, as well as the appearances of zombie-like figures in historical and anthropological accounts. And so I just want to quickly share some of those uh, observations with you. I don't want you to try to read these slides that I'm going to be put it, putting up. For now, just let your eye notice two important things. One is that the earliest use of the word zombie that I found dates to 1697, and that the latest point on my chart here is 1929, and that's because the last one is William Seabrook's Magic Island. This was the book that brought the zombie to the attention of Americans and to filmmakers, and from then, I mean, there's no point in making a chart because you would just have an explosion of zombie references. On this next slide, I just show you that there have been the word, uh, even very early on, appeared in Spanish, French, and English. In this slide, I show you that those that are highlighted in green 
are when the word is used to refer to the Angla Angolan uh, deity, who was also called zombie, so nothing like the zombie that we're here to talk about today. In yellow, these are references that refer to zombies, but they're really more like uh, ghosts, like phantoms, sometimes like a menacing sort of sprite. So zombie has meant a lot of different, different things over the years. On this slide, I really show, um, oh, this slide takes us back in time to Africa. So we're going further and farther back in time to see this earliest reference. Finally, on this one, I show that there, this is just a breakdown showing you the differences between when zombie means zombie and when it means something else. So I'm just going to go through all, I know that this is already way more than you ever wanted to know about zombie etymology, and I'm not expecting you to read these slides. I'm just going to sort of pan through them. And as I do that, I want you to sort of just try to catch on to some words like ghost, spirit, phantom, revenant. The question remains, after doing all of this research, how did the zombie myth settle into one about the walking corpse? Well, here is an important clue. In the late 18th century, a couple of Englishmen living in the Caribbean wrote on, British, on the British colony of Jamaica and on other Caribbean islands. And among their descriptions of the culture of the slaves are descriptions of obi, which is sometimes called voodoo, um, and of the practitioners of this. And specifically, this description that I've really hit on as being very central concerns these witch doctors who would introduce a poison into somebody's system. Everyone would agree that this person was dead. Then they would introduce another poison or uh, remedy, and the person would appear to reanimate, and they would say, see, I am capable of raising the dead. The, uh, if that sounds a little bit familiar to those of you who have already made a foray into zombie scholarship, uh, here's Wade Davis. Everybody, every zombie fan has to know Wade Davis. They made a movie about it, which might be why you know, but he was a Harvard, uh, a Harvard scholar who went to Haiti to study the pharmacological properties of the zombifying powder and potion. And the reason he was inspired to do that was because there were, at the time, and you'll remember a few slides back, I showed a slide that said real life zombies. There were people in Haiti coming forward saying, I was zombified. So that was a moment when people were really realizing, okay, something is going on. Let's find out what's happening scientifically here. And Wade Davis found out that this was a science that went back much earlier than the 1980s when he was in Haiti. And this is another famous piece of zombie lore that really this presentation just wouldn't have been complete without. This is the 1835 Haitian Penal Code, Article 249. Uh, and this is just showing that it had become, by 1839, such a phenomenon and a problem of people poisoning each other and then the appearance of death being created, sometimes that appearance of death being banished, but probably other times it just not working out that way, that this really illustrates to us that this science of zombie making was already underway. But let's go back. So let's, I just want to remind ourselves that we were talking about Brian Edwards and this text in the late 1700s, uh, which was already describing these witch doctors doing this poisoning. Well, who had read that? Interestingly, both Mary Shelley and Samuel Taylor Coleridge had read that. Now, Mary Shelley had definitely read that book before composing Frankenstein. Samuel Taylor Coleridge, I haven't been able to assess wh when in time he wrote it or he read the book because he just says in his journal that he had read it at some point. But it's important to me because in Rime of the Ancient Mariner, he has figures uh, that are very, very zombie-like. So that's really neither here nor there, but it's just a bit of interesting, it's just an interesting fact that I unearthed along the way. But how, exactly how far back can we trace the zombie? Well, I feel that we can see its heritage in a myth first chronicled by Dutch slavers who write of the natives of the province of Loango, nothing is more ridiculous than the opinion they hold that there is no natural death and that no one dies except by the malice and enchantments of his enemy who by means of the same spell resuscitate him, transport him to a desert place and make him work there for the enemy's own profit. So basically what this slide really illustrates, it, this I feel like is the oldest genetic ancestor of the zombie. You have here uh, a myth that is very obviously about slavery. It's, ab it's about a fear that their enemies, and the enemies located in this passage are the Gobi, uh, who were a slave trading people. It's a fear that um, it, the myth of the zombie, I believe, really comes out of this, this African origin. So let's transpose it. This is the kingdom from which they're from in Loango. Uh, so that sort of settles for me, my first part of my thesis. It's all about slavery. 
Uh, and then I have some other parts I'm going to skip over because I feel like I've really bored you guys with history enough. But if you are interested in my thoughts on how the word zombie becomes attached to this uh, soul capture myth, then ask me about it afterward. But let's turn now to how is it at the same time also about slave rebellion? Well, it's always about slave rebellion because from the earliest incarnations of the myth in Haiti, there's an element of the mythology which really strangely dropped out of American culture, and that is that you can unmake a zombie by giving them salt. Uh, salt will either banish sort of their zombie state and allow, and they will return to their grave, or in some instances, it will make, it will make them turn upon their masters in a very violent way. And this appears in multiple places, but the most interesting thing to me is that this appears even in the old O'Dapper myth, the 16th century, uh, or sorry, 17th century myth coming to us from Africa, where it said at the end that the murderer there feeds him meats without salt, because if, he, if the resuscitated were to taste salt, he would pursue his killer relentlessly. So my take on the zombie dialectic is just this, that the zombie is always about slavery, but the zombie is also always about slave rebellion. I just felt like this image from Land of the De Dead really kind of summed it up, uh, because on the one hand, they appear very slave-like. They have those, the blanked out eyes. But the other, on the other hand, you see this mob just extending into the horizon, and it's also very, very threatening. So you can easily see from this sign, it's not always slavery and slave rebellion at the same time as it was in that land of the dead still. Usually you have to, a myth that sort of tends to lean one way or the other. In the first image here, we have a fake movie poster that was inspired by this recent attention you may have read about in the science world to various parasites that take over insects. I know I've read at least about zombie ants and I think zombie caterpillars, but I've also read about zombie funguses. So these are basically a parasitic kind of creature that takes over the body of another insect and uses it to accomplish something. Either it kills it and it uses its corpse to sort of transmit a virus or uh, its rep reproductive capacities. Do you have a question? Oh, no, no, just, just, I know what you're talking about here. It says, the zombie says it's taking over the other, the other organisms. Right. And you spread spores. So yeah. Well, I've read about three different cases. But yeah, in the fungus one, it definitely could work like that. So this was just a poster that some, uh, one of these science websites created. And on the other side, you have uh, a picket sign from a zombie protest that we're going to talk about a little bit more later. And this person wrote, rise up. So you can very easily see um, the way that the iconography of the zombie is borrowed for, for a sort of slave rebellion type image in the rise up picket fence. We have to be aware of the fact that the, zombie and I, that the zombie is always an insufficient symbol for revolution. One might associate revolution with resurrection, with the dead standing in for the disempowered, coming to achieve subjectivity, gaining personhood, but the zombie is not resurrected. It is just a walking dead. So typically it really bothers me when I see people say, happy zombie day on Easter, or when people say Jesus was a zombie, because there is a difference and I know that Professor Russ is going to talk about this more tomorrow, there is a difference between resurrection and just reanimation. So uh, a Haitian scholar, Raphael Lucas, uh, once said that the zombie is always about failure. And I think as, insofar as the zombie is used as a figure associated with rebellion and revolution, the zombie does, in some sense, always kind of fail. On the other hand, though, even this image of these zombie ants kind of lumbering, looking blank-eyed, obviously wearing the corporate dress, so that's supposed to be that they, uh, they're supposed to represent the slave part of it. Even that image is a little threatening because it's, again, drawing on that, uh, that association between the zombie and the horde, the zombie and the masses, the zombie and the mob. So my argument is that the zombie is never anymore entirely the innocuous slave, and neither is it a complete symbol of revolution. Rather, these are sort of intermeshed. And I see this element at work even when zombie films are overtly about virus, because the virus sort of invades, confiscates, and turns the body against itself. I also see it at work in much subtler ways. And so I set myself the task today of trying to think of an example uh, where it's not so easy to see that slavery and slave rebellion might be in the mix, but I think I can make an argument that it is. So I'm not going to talk about this, even though I'm sure a lot of people would be happy for me to, because I'm sure a lot of people in the room have read it. Um, so everybody probably knows this quote-unquote mashup, Pride and Prejudice and Zombies, and you can probably all agree with me that it's a zombie text. Literally, Seth Graham Smith has inserted zombies into Jane Austen's original text. 
But this is also a zombie text on the level of form, because it takes a text with which we are familiar and alters it, putting it to new uses, much the same way as the zombie is an evacuated body that still has the same basic outward shape, but which now has an entirely different constitution. But here's the example I really wanted to get to, because zombies in art are sort of one of my pets. Uh, so this is from the installation I briefly mentioned before, created by Deborah Drexler and called Gauguin Zombie. It was first exhibited in 2003, but there is an interactive website that's currently live, so you can go and take a virtual tour of the exhibit. But before we see the images and hear about the narrative that Drexler created for her, for her installation, I thought it would be a little bit helpful if we just reminded ourselves of what Gauguin's artwork actually looks like. So I just want to show you a few things. And the only bit of information that I think you need to understand why Drexler might have chosen Gauguin rather than another artist to zombify is that he was the post-impressionist uh, who went to Tahiti and infused a sort of quote-unquote primitivist style into his work without, some critics might argue, really acknowledging his own sense of privilege in the culture from which he was, he was benefiting. So the story of Drexler's multimedia installation is that an art museum has decided to put forward an exhibition called The Fathers of Modern Art, but instead of displaying their paintings, they're displaying their bodies. They are displaying their corpses. Uh, uh, usually, you know, in zombie stories, there's always an element where something goes wrong, and in this zombie story, what, something goes wrong in the embalming process, and Gauguin reawakens as a zombie. Uh, due to protests concerning the ethics of the exhibit, the show is canceled, and Gauguin is extradited back to Paris, where he wanders around, followed everywhere by the Tahitian specter of death, the Tupapa. So I might mention at this point that it's a multimedia exhibit, so it's not just oil paintings, but there's also like faxes. There, you could see the picket signs in the back, but there's a lot of emails about like, should we put this uh, exhibit on? No, people are going to go crazy. It, it's a very sort of eclectic and sort of strange exhibit. There's also beautiful watercolor paintings and the zombie's journal, which lets you into his head. Uh, I don't know if I feel like that's consistent with zombie mythology, but there you have it. So in Paris, Gauguin really tries, zombie Gauguin, I should say, really tries to find pleasure in his old hobbies, prostitutes mainly, and also painting, but he ends up lonely and yearning uh, to return to the island where he died. So in what ways is this a zombie text? Uh, well, much like Graham Smith Green's text, it is not just that it's, she's letting herself be influenced by the style and color palette of Gauguin's work, but even in some instances, she replicates almost exactly Gauguin's images with just the insertion of a f small few zombie details. So like in this one, you can see it's just way in the back, uh, you see Gauguin and the Haitian Tupapa. But otherwise, I, the clothes have gotten an update, but otherwise it's basically the same painting. So what I feel this achieves here, and also in Graham Smith's popular book, is that the addition of the zombie points out a negligent omission, or even what I, sometimes you might call a willful repression of depiction of empire in the colonial world. Right, so in Austin's case, or in Graham Smith Green's case, he might be pointing to the fact that uh, colonial empire was not talked about in, in Austin's version, version of Regency England, or that it wasn't given its full due. In this case, in Drexler's case, putting the zombie into these images makes visible the native mythologies that were just out of frame. In a way, then, this work repossesses Gauguin's commandeering of the Tahitian people for his artistic subject, and I would argue it avenges them by turning the tables. Here, Gauguin is zombified, and you can really see that quite well from that canvas there in the back of the, the hut, which the whole hut was a part of the exhibit. So, since zombies in art are an interest of mine, uh, and this is also what my chapter from the book Better Off Dead discusses, I wanted to profile for you now two very different zombies. In the white suit, you have performance artist Jillian McDonald, who we've already kind of been introduced through because that was her piece that we watched at the very opening. And Jillian has done various installations, videos, and other work involving zombies. Um, on the left, you have Thea Munster, who is the self-proclaimed, but I'm inclined to believe her, founder of the Zombie Walk movement, and we're also going to hear about her. So here's a little bit about Jillian. This is a still from a video Jillian did uh, called Fields of the Dead and Undead. She also was kind enough to let us use this for the cover of our book. 
Here's another one sort of similar. This piece I think is called Zombie Apocalypse. That might interest you, Mark. Um, here, this one I, I have a great affection for, and even though it's not about zombies, I had to show it. This is really what got her, sort of put her on the map. She does the, these, uh, this work where she digitally inserts herself into films, opposite film stars, and most often making out with film stars. Uh, right now I'm writing on a piece that she did where she digitally inserted herself into a scene from Meet Joe Black, and it's called Staring Contest with Brad Pitt. So her work is really, really fun. These are more zombies. These were lenticular images of zombies. This is one called Zombie Loop, where you have in a gallery two different, you have screens projected simultaneously on different walls, one in which she plays a fleeing damsel, and the other in which she herself plays the chasing zombie, and it just rotates continuously to give this sort of sense of interrupted climax. Now, this is the piece that really got me hooked on Jillian's work. Uh, this is called Horror Makeup. And it was a performance art piece. So again, like I, uh, I like to stress that with performance art, the art is the live performance. So it's not the video that you might be able to find somewhere on the internet. It was that experience of being on the subway train. And here's what she did. She got on the subway in New York City with a little makeup kit. And she sat there putting on makeup like women do all the time. But instead of just putting on makeup like she was going to work, she transformed her whole face into a hideous, decaying zombie, very realistically. And uh, I was sorry that I wasn't able to get the video to show you a little bit of it. But you can sort of see from these still images that people on the train were really perturbed. Look at this woman. You see this woman. It goes sort of top down and then top down. The woman is looking at her and then looking very irritated and then, you know, suddenly she's not there in the shot anymore. So after I discovered Jillian McDonald and her work on zombies, I personally got in touch with her. And then I found out that she was doing this piece that you watched a little clip from, Zombies in Condo Land. So again, this was taking place in Toronto in 2008 for this all night long uh, art festival that they do where people put different installations all around the city. Uh, and hers was a zombie, all night long zombie film shoot. Uh, for months before, she had up this website where people could, asking for volunteers and encouraging people to come participate. I was there, I, these probably are familiar because you just saw the video, but I was there taking part in this. And in fact, I'm in that little video that you saw. I'm the one in the furry hat looking much more like a zombie raccoon than just like an actual zombie. But now let's move on and talk, to, talk about Thea Munster. So Toronto was an important choice for, for um, Gillian McDonald to choose as the setting for her Zombies in Condoland because Toronto is the site of the first ever zombie mob or zombie walk. Uh, in 2003, this woman, Thea Folds, who calls herself Thea Munster, put up flyers in Toronto, Canada and began a global phenomenon. She asked people to show up dressed like zombies at an appointed time and place. Unlike previous events that orchestrated public displays of zombies for promotional purposes, like, for example, a film screening or the new opening of a horror store, uh, Munster's event was novel because it was entirely devoid of any purpose, commercial enterprise, or social agenda besides the interruption of the everyday. In my chapter of Better Off Dead, so I read these various installations that McDonald's done, and I read Munster's events, and I'm reading them sort of against the backdrop of a longer history of social activist performance art. But so within a couple of years, after Thea's first zombie walk in Toronto, there were copycat events in major cities across the country. And then there were zombie walks. There were also zombie flash mobs, which tend to be much more spontaneous, less advertised, and pre-planned. And they were now being held year-round, not just around the Halloween season. And so as of the writing of my most recent article that I've developed on the subject, which was just this past summer, there are registered zombie walk forums in 20 countries worldwide and 49 of the United States, with only Delaware, for some reason, <laughs> staying zombie-free. But really, this, things change so fast. By now, zombie, uh, Delaware has probably had a zombie walk. So I wanted to just go through and show you some of the beautiful images that come out of Thea Munster's Toronto zombie walks. Because to me, these are really great examples of communally made art. Here's an incredible one. This picture is called Glass Face. Uh, these are just people who you know, show up and they do crazy good makeup and they really perform their hearts out as zombies. 
Um, so after doing all of this research, I came to a really quite firm conviction that this was all happening because people needed the form of rebellion even in the absence of real protest. And that these zombie events were kind of like placeholders for rebellion. And here essentially is the conclusion that I came to. I'm just going to read a quote from, my, from this book that's in the back. To me, these zombie happenings are most aptly non-events, anti-revolutions. It's not, after all, what the zombie says that is important, but it's mere presence that communicates. The zombie presents a theoretical oddity, a frozen, irresolvable dialectic, an embodiment of opposites that displays simultaneously that which is not there by that which is. Even something as innocuous as 2,200 people convening on a street corner to moan and stumble around in fake blood and face paint is a display of the collective working together, a reminder of the Haitian Revolution in which the zombie has its roots, and a veiled threat as if to suggest what else might be possible, what dark army could rise and exact its revenge if it ever comes to that. So basically, in a nutshell, my hunch was that this was the zombie mob phenomenon had taken off like it did because of the disaffection of a generation living under the Bush administration and the coalition of the willing and going to a war that really, at least that demographic of the population had no interest in going to. Um, and they also, and I felt like they were turning to the image of the zombie as a way of displaying their frustration. And they didn't just do it in zombie walks and zombie mobs, but they also did it in humans versus zombies, uh, campus-wide tag games in zombie proms, in zombie pub crawls. Um, there were very few cases in which the zombie mob at that time was overtly politicized. Here's an exemption. This is uh, from a San Francisco. San Francisco zombie mob tended to be pretty political. And here they are invading the Apple store at a new mall. Here there were some zombies in 2008 at an anti-Palin rally across the street from where she was speaking. Um, but wherever people are gathering, there are opportunities to make money. And cities and towns across America, shortly thereafter, got zombie fever. So what I wanted you to notice about this slide, these are some sort of more recent zombie walk posters. I just wanted you to look at that row along the bottom and see how many of these things now have corporate sponsorship. And this can be, it could be just a little local tavern that you know, throws in some money. Uh, and get some free advertising, or it could be something like this Miller High Life one that's really big. So my feeling was really that Thea Munster's zombie walk, where she just wanted it to be about, about nothing, about just disrupting the everyday, not about capitalism, had really gotten taken over exactly by the enemy, by capitalism. Uh, and here's just an example of one I think is really bad. You can hardly even see the poster. Uh, it's just all advertisements. But you'll notice at the bottom there it says, very, very faintly, I don't know if you can see it, benefit for C Sienna Francis House. And that was the other thing that was happening at the same time, is that people were realizing, wow, we can make money off this, and wow, we can make money off this for charity. Uh, I would argue that both things, even though you might say, well, the charity one's not so bad, that both of them actually have the effect of anesthetizing any kind of political commentary that might have been there in the zombie walk to begin with. So here's just a whole panoply of zombie walks for charity. Um, there were zombie blood drives, zombie food drives, even something for an animal shelter and March of Dimes. Um, and then this was a really bad one. Uh, it got a lot of press because this was a Brisbane zombie walk where unfortunately their charity was brain damage. And they just kind of didn't think that through. And they got <laughs> in a lot of trouble. But so basically. Like I said, uh, zombie walks like Thea's were definitely on the down, and this, these sort of commercialized charity, I, I, was, I think I've invented a word, and or philanthropophized uh, walks were on the uptick. And then something happened, and I really, I might have to sort of gloss through this, this whole narrative, and we can maybe talk more about it in the Q&A, because it is quite long, but I'll just give you the nuts and bolts version. I had this theory. My theory was, OK, zombie walks and real revolution. When we have something to actually protest, surely zombie walks are going to go away. And then I didn't really have to wait that long because 2009 came, and we had student protests all over the country and in 52 countries worldwide. And uh, students were taking over their campuses. They were demonstrating. And I wanted to see 
what's happening to zombie walks when this is going on? So I did a whole lot of research, and I'm not going to bore you with the figures and, and everything. But basically, these are my findings. So here are some questions that I posed myself. Were fewer zombie events planned and carried out in times and places where student protests were occurring, taking into consideration both flash mobs and annual events? Well, no. Zombie flash mobs maintain an equivalent frequency to previous years, or indeed in some certain places, such as the United Kingdom, they seem to become more prevalent during this time. So the short answer there is no. Were there fewer attendees, uh, like actual zombies showing up to events, even though there might have been the same number of events planned, were they drawing smaller crowds uh, in 2009, 2010 than in previous years? No. On the contrary, new records for zombie events attendance were set in 2009, and various places were competing for all of these different awards. So again, the short answer there is no. Was the same result equally true of Europe, the United States, and other geographic regions that have a zombie walk presence? On the whole, yes. Zombie events worldwide were not at all impacted by the presence of student events. So really, this is a long way around to saying my thesis was completely and utterly wrong, but now I wanted to know why. So I think you can really get it all from this chart right here, which uh, I've oh, in, in green you have the year in student protest, and then what I did was I picked five areas where you had uh, the most uh, zombie activity, stu student protest, or you'd had a, a high rate of zombie activity before, and I wanted to see what would happen. And as you can see, it really kept up. It followed the exact same arc. And in fact, you can even chart it down to locations and to the, even almost to the week. Uh, these things were still overlapping. So, my hunch had been that the demographic that had been organizing zombie pageants and zombie pub crawls was now using the same social media to organize the occupation of public buildings on their college campuses. I felt that a hasty tweet about a spontaneous zombie mob had surely given way to an urgent one proclaiming the formation of an actual mob determined to make their discontent visible to university administrators and government bureaucrats. But in fact, what I'm forced to confront is the fact that we really don't have any good studies on, zo on these zombie mob demographics. And I don't, know, uh, I don't know if it's just that the people who are participating in student protests have limitless energy and can do both at the same time, or uh, if maybe the zombie mobs are pulling from a much more, and I think this hunch is probably going to be con confirmed, a much more suburbanite uh, presence. We'll sort of touch on that at the end. The other thing that really came out of my research was that I noticed that some of the stu student protests that were being held by zombies were, or sorry, student protests were also including zombies in them. So these I would not count as a zombie walk. It's clearly a student protest, but they're using zombies in them. This is one that happened on my own campus. Uh, it was called Mark Rudolph's Thriller, where these students dressed up as zombies and they performed Michael Jackson's Thriller, but they had changed the lyrics. So again, I would kind of call that a sort of zombie text. And here's a little snippet of the lyrics. I'm not going to sing it, but just try to imagine that the song is playing. Start of the quarter, something evil's lurking in the dark. Inside your inbox, your billing statement almost stopped your heart. You start to scream, but you're not loud enough to reach the Board of Regents. So I felt that in a lot of these student protests, the image of the zombie was used to really say, hey, we feel like nobody is listening. We feel dead. We feel disempowered. Um, but then there were other more quirky uses of the zombie in protest that I just thought I'd share with you. Here's one uh, where the tagline was, zombies need brains, support the Oakland Public Library. Very cute. Uh, sometimes it was more oblique. This was a protest. <laughs> yeah. I think you guys already get the joke. This was a protest that was held at the San Francisco City Hall, and it was just called a civil rights protest, or I think a zombie rights protest. But the fact that it took place at San Francisco City Hall when we've been embroiled in a huge debate about the legality of gay marriage, and the fact that sort of one of their tasks was to interrupt heterosexual marriages, uh, I think kind of gives it away what they were after. By the way, I got married at San Francisco City Hall, and if zombies had been there to interrupt my wedding, I would have been thrilled. <laughs> But so we have more zombies interrupting a wedding. Uh, you might have read about this. This was uh, the day of the royal wedding last spring. Um, several teenage girls were arrested just for being dressed up like zombies. They weren't doing anything else. In fact, they were sitting in a coffee shop at the time of their arrest, I think. Um, and 
the charges, formal charges, were just suspicion to disrupt the peace. So, um, so I think that this, on the other side of the coin, to the disempowered zombie, this really illustrates that the zombie is still a very threatening, it's a menacing kind of image for people. I, I have to give a little shout out because some people are still acknowledging, acknowledging the subversive potential of the zombie. So here's just one of my faves. This is a, a zombie walk poster where they've taken it from a Soviet poster and they've sort of redone. Um, oh, this is just an example of how zombies need to be careful. This is very much like the Brisbane example. These zombies showed up to protest um, Governor Scott Walker and they happened to do it on the same day as he was talking about the Special Olympics. So nobody listened to him and they just were treated as, you know, anathema. Um, here is a great example of the zombie dialectic at work. Um, you have on the one hand this zombie workers rise up poster. And this was for a, a rally about raising the minimum wage in New Zealand, I believe. And then on the other side, you have a protest that was advertised as Parliament of the Living Dead. And it was put on all the forums. I actually calculated it in with my statistics when I was doing all of those charts. Um, but I want you to notice something a little bit weird about this. What do you notice that's strange about this, this zombie mob? Are there the professional photographers? No. What about the signs? So this was actually an event that was staged by Capcom Entertainment, the video game manufacturer. Its agenda was really to advertise their latest video game. But they staged this event during the same time as student protests. And so that also served to kind of co-opt a little bit of the excitement and momentum surrounding the student protests and redirect it towards the purchase of quality zombie shoot 'em ups <laughs> Most recently, of course, and we're coming full circle, we're winding it down. Most recently, of course, we had the Occupy Wall Street zombies. Uh, and I wanted to read to you the directive that told them to dress up like zombies. This was from their headquarters. Uh, it was a little thing that said, everyone come dressed as a corporate zombie. This means jacket and tie, if possible, white face, fake blood, eating Monopoly money, which is a new twist. I enjoy that. And doing a slow march. So when people come to work on Monday in this neighborhood, they see us reflecting the metaphor of their actions. And I don't know what that is supposed to mean. <laughs> Tell your friends, Facebook it, Twitter it, and it can be MJ thriller style too. Create a different image than police brutality. So, you know, most people just thought this was kind of cutesy. One blogger, this is from gawker.com, wrote, hey, Occupy Wall Street, dressing up like zombies is dumb. And uh, I had to agree with this. Uh, he says, usually we associate zombies with lame suburban pub crawls. Um, and so to me, and I just want, I really want to end on this image because it really shows to me this dialectic of slave-slave rebellion. It also shows to me the other uh, zombie dialectic, which is sort of like a success and failure kind of a thing. Because to me, this image is both beautiful and terrible because it's, because my, excuse me, my feeling is that due to the dual nature of the zombie and its ultimately ambivalent representation of slave, slave rebellion, just as with life and death, we can follow this as a general guideline in the future. If there is a zombie there, then it isn't a real revolution. My advice to the Wall Street occupiers, if it's a revolution you want, next time leave the face paint at home, grab a pitchfork, and rise up. Thank you very much. Sorry, sorry, there were a few hiccups in there. It was so dark up here, I could not read my own notes. Uh, I, we already have a burning question in the back. Um, yeah, I just had a, a question. Yeah. Um, one, I was wondering on your statistics, uh, how do you know that the zombie that you're talking about is actually the zombie that you're talking about? How many of these events for the zombies were sponsored? And if that one up as well? That's a great idea, and that's not something I looked at. Uh, that, the way I did it was just, it, it's really hard to st study zombies for a number of reasons, because d d these so sort of zombie events, because they only really get press in the papers a lot of times if they're sponsored. If people think, oh, this is going to draw a lot of attention, it's going to draw a lot of business to the area, 
Then you'll see it hyped in newspapers beforehand. The unfortunate thing with that, though, is that they won't give you a tally of how many people were there at the end because they've already done their job of hyping it to get people there. And if you're lucky, you might be able to follow the thread and find out in the next year when they're trying to hype their following year's event how many people showed up for the last one. But so, no, I haven't really looked at corporate sponsorship. The truth is, it's overwhelming. I mean, they're, they're almost, I would say, except for Toronto, and even Toronto, I love Thea Munster, she's great, but she's done some things, like they had Romero's latest film available for purchase on their website, and I was like, no, <laughs> sorry. That's, to me, that's kind of selling out, but. Okay. And I had a question. How do you think uh, you could zombify corporations since they're not human? Uh, well, that's, a that's, good, a, that's a good question. Um, how could we zombify? I, would more symbolic. I, I mean, I don't mean to say that symbols are without power. I absolutely think they are. But I think what that, that blogger was really hitting upon is pretty true. Zombies, it's not just that they're played out. It's that they, the corp corporations have stolen that image from us because they have taken over zombie walk movements so much that just like he said, we associate zombie walks now with suburbanite pub crawls. So it's over. In fact, I once gave a talk where I started off by saying, the zombie walk movement is dead. And now most people hadn't even heard about the zombie walk movement yet, so they kind of just thought I was crazy. But um, yeah. I don't know that I answered your question, but I think it's really, it's really still a good and valuable thing to point out the way corporations are zombifying, to point out the way corporations aren't really human, and therefore they are kind of like a zombie entity. Um, so I would say, yeah, definitely use the iconography, but just be aware that you might be coming off as silly and not as serious if you, if you are. Yeah. Thank you. Yes, in the blouse? Um, I, I know, this is really short, so. Okay. <laughs> Yeah. It is. It is. I completely agree with that. Yeah. It is. So the only thing to do is to zombify them back. And I mean, that's an area, a kettle of fish I didn't even want to get into in this. But you sort of see it with the Gauguin presentation that she is reclaiming somebody that's already sort of zombified, right? Because Gauguin, I would say, like almost infected or, you know, took on the skin of what Tahitian art looked like and benefited from it. And so what she's doing is like almost like a bigger fish swallowing that fish. So yeah, I think that's the way we have to go forward from here, uh, is to figure out how we re-zombify the, the corporate takeover of zombies. Yeah, thanks for your question. In the back. They're afraid of, say, say that last bit again, they're afraid of what? They're not, they're not necessarily afraid of zombies, they're afraid of becoming zombies. Exactly, yeah. Whereas you see in cinema, you actually see a lot of people fear zombies. Yeah. And they're afraid of being zombies. Yeah. And that's why they're afraid of being zombies. Yeah. And that's why they're afraid of being zombies. Yeah. And that's why they're afraid of being zombies. Yeah. And that's why they're afraid of being zombies. Yeah. And that's why they're afraid of being zombies. Yeah. And that's why they're afraid of being zombies. Yeah. And that's why they're afraid of being zombies. Yeah. And that's why they're afraid of being zombies. Yeah. And that's why they're afraid of being zombies. Yeah. And that's why they're afraid of being zombies. Yeah. And that's why they're afraid of being zombies. Yeah. And that's why they're afraid of being zombies. Yeah. And that's why they're afraid of being zombies. Yeah. And that's why they're afraid of being zombies. Yeah. And that's why they're afraid of being zombies. Yeah. And that's why they're afraid of being zombies. Yeah. And that's why they're afraid of being zombies. Yeah. And that's why they're afraid of being zombies. Yeah to a fear of being a zombie, more so than fear of being eaten by one. So uh, for those of you who may not be as up on all of the zombie folklore, in Haiti, people are much more afraid that they're going to be turned into a zombie than they are that they're going to be attacked by a zombie. For one, because zombies don't attack in Haiti. They're, they are these pitiful creatures that just sort of roam around. And they might be sort of scary. It might be kind of terrifying to be confronted with a dead man. Um, but they don't really pose any immediate danger. It's in the American cinema that we make the zombie actively bad. Um, but so yeah, I think with this Occupy Wall Street stuff and, and the use of zombies in protest, maybe what we are sort of, we are in fact going back and inhabiting that earlier thing and saying like, we're slaves like zombies. So yeah, I definitely think that this is more of a return to that older way of looking at the mythology. We had, I had like a bunch of hands. I'm just gonna go front to back and kind of zigzag it. So you in the um, tank top? Witchcraft 
the unga. Mm -hmm. He would, uh, he would have them do agriculture. Right. In fact, there are three different types of zombies in Haiti. There's the zombie jardin, the zombie atelier, and the zombie matala, and there might be one more. But those three mean like garden zombie, like who does agricultural outdoor work, factory or studio or workshop zombie who does like, you know, craft stuff. And then zombie matala, which is mattress zombie, which is a sex slave. And that's obviously much more rare. That's written about uh, by Rene Depest and some other Haitian novelists, but I don't know if that's really, it might be sort of him sort of exaggerating one current of the mythology. And their, uh, their brains are deteriorated from the, from the poison, right? The literal, I understand, yeah. I mean, my understanding of the real Haitian zombies is that I think they are people who are kept in a drug drug-induced kind of coma where their, their bodies only really have limited basic functions. They can follow basic commands. So if people say, chop all this wood, they can do that, but they can't really have much of a conversation. <laughs> I'm, I'm going to come back to you up here. I'm going to continue zigzagging back in the back row with the black t-shirt. Yeah, I mean, that's so there in the early zombie films. Uh, so there. In fact, it's still there. So, so in the earliest zombie films, and I kind of wish I was quicker on the, I could pull up that slide of white zombie. If, for those of you staying, you should really stay and see white zombie tonight. But um, people always point to that as a classic example. Because in the posters that hyped that ad, there was this undercurrent of like, oh no, the black men are going to get her and do whatever they want with her. So it was really about ra fears of race and miscegenation, even when it wasn't directly about uh, uh, rape or, or anything. I feel like there was still this kind of undercurrent like contamination. You're going to be contaminated by living in the tropics. You're going to be contaminated by the witch doctor's influence. So even I still feel like fears of racial uh, miscegenation are still embedded in that, even when it seems like they're, like they're more distant. But yeah, but I was going to say, Resident Evil 4, I think it is, wow. The race stuff that's going on in that, wow. That's all I can say. <laughs> uh, it takes place in Africa. You're shooting Africans all, all day long. Five? Thank you. Five. Thank you. Yeah. Um, this guy. Oh, do you know how, like, zombies eating brains started? That's a good question. I mean, I know the first movie that we have zombies eating brains is Return of the Living Dead, unless somebody else has an earlier one that I don't know about. Um, but I don't know why they latched on to that. I don't know why they decided that they were going to eat brains rather than other things. Maybe it's because the zombies aren't really very conscious. So it's all, they're brain dead. So maybe like eating other people's brains kind of feeds them and helps to propel them further. But other people might. Does anybody have an an, a better answer for this young man? Yeah. You mean in that film? Well, that's because, yeah, because most zombies, right, most zombies will be destroyed or deanimated if you destroy the brain. But Night of the Living Dead and that copycat series that came out after Romero is one of the exceptions where you really, they have to be chopped up into tiny little bits and even then they'll flop around. Um, one more question. I'm going to take you back there and gray. Mm -hmm. What would they do after they destroyed their masters? They would go to their graves. They never, the thing is about, I've never seen a zombie, maybe there's some like 70s, 80s movie that plays with the myth, but I've never seen Haitian zombies coming back to consciousness from eating salt. They just, they realize that they're dead. That's what all the narratives say, is that like if they taste salt, they realize, oh my God, I'm dead. And so either this makes them so furious that they destroy the plantation usually, which again is a huge symbol of slave rebellion, burning the cane fields. Um, and, or they just calmly start walking and they walk until they find their graves and then they lay down on their graves. 
and die. What, do you want to do one more? Uh, or, no, I think we're are we all we are wrapped up? Okay, well, thank you so much for having me and listening to me talk about zombies. <laughs>